Again, it is so good to see you this morning and to be here worshiping together. Are you able to hear me all right out there? Terry, can you turn me up just a little bit, please? This week, our kids have had the opportunity to experience and encounter Jesus in five different places in the scriptures. And so I want to go through those really quick before we get to our text. And uh, it all fits right in because we're going to encounter Jesus in a sixth one this morning. On Monday, we began by encountering Jesus in the temple as a child. He was found in the temple listening to the teachers and asking questions. And the crazy thing is, he understood it better than they did. Oftentimes, we don't give our kids the opportunity or the chance to understand what is going on around them. And we shortchange our kids sometimes, don't we? And we... We do it not even knowing sometimes, but I promise you they're capable of more than what you think. One of the craziest things for someone who starts working with youth is that they are never looking at you or paying attention to you, you would think, in this moment. Okay, it's, it's the most frustrating, disastrous thing you're thinking of. But then you begin to ask questions, you begin to hear them talking to their friends, and they heard everything that you said. They're not, that's just the way kids work, and some of you adults work the same way. You're riding the entire time or you're doing something else, but you hear things. But we need to give our kids the opportunity to hear. Christ tells us to call them to him. He calls the children to him. On Tuesday, we encounter Jesus at the river at his baptism. The heavens open up and the voice of God proclaims Jesus as his son and whom he is well pleased with. And the Holy Holy Spirit ascends on him as a dove and and prepares Jesus for the ministry that's ahead of him. It's kind of the opening into those three years when, when there's miracles and miraculous things happening in the presence of Christ. Wednesday, we see Jesus at the Sea of Galilee. Disciples go ahead of him and, and leave him to prepare, and a storm erupts, and it scares the disciples. One of the most miraculous things happens, though, Jesus is seen walking towards them on the water. Now, I've done a lot of floating in my life, but I've never done a lot of walking on water. One of the kids said that they went out to the, the, the beach this last spring, you know, when the, everything was flooded as, as bad as it was. It's still flooded, but still as bad as it was. And, and the picnic table was just under the water, and so they were pretending that they were walking on the water because it looked like they were. The table was underwater. They got it. They understood the picture. Thursday, we encounter Jesus at the empty tomb, the most glorious of days. Mary walks to the tomb and finds it's empty. She thinks she is talking to the gardener, but it turns out to be Jesus. And Mary is sent to tell the others the good news that Jesus Christ has risen. The Messiah has truly come and completed his task. But then on the last day, the kids had the opportunity to encounter Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Two men are heading to Emmaus, and another joins them, answering their questions and talking about the, the, the events of the Passion Week that was before them when, when everything was happening and all the things in the city were going on and the darkness falling. And they're discussing these things, but they're discussing them as as someone who has lost. They didn't win, okay? Jesus died, but they apparently hadn't listened to the times that he had told them that he would not that he would be resurrected again. But they experienced Jesus on the road to Emmaus answering the questions and showing and proving that he truly was the resurrected Messiah. What I loved about this week was that in every direction the kids and the adults because I know some of my volunteers said um, we had some great storytellers doing our Bible studies, and, um, and some of our adults said that they had got caught up and not knowing what to, you know, they, they were just like a kid feasting on the Word of God as the story was being told to them. But we all got to experience Jesus. We had the opportunity to experience Him. And, and I know, it, and many of you do as well, that it was, That is, when we encounter Jesus, that everything begins to change. It is the encounter itself that allows the change to begin to happen. 
Men and women and children are forever changed when they come to see Jesus as the source of salvation, the only source of salvation. One of our missionaries, Jorge Santiago, shared the gospel with Chris, this guy named Christian, and uh, he was an atheist but became a Christian, and, and his, but his name was Christian. Craziness, isn't it? So Christian, um, he answers the question by saying that he, was, he made Jesus his only Savior. Now, I don't know how many of you can say that Jesus is your only Savior because in America and across the world, we attempt to add things into that. But he was, Jesus was his only Savior. It was in VBS 1995 in Miller, Missouri that I sat in that old brown cushioned pew and, and heard how God loved me so much that Jesus came to die just for me. I was nine years old. And I encountered Jesus in that pew, and my life was forever changed. And many of you have great stories of salvation just like that. You know, sometimes we get caught up in these stories of people who go from meth head to pastor, or from this total lostness to saved, and those are beautiful and wonderful stories. But I can also tell you that your testimony is just as important as theirs. I know people who have actually tried to affect their testimony story so that it had better impact, and it doesn't work that way. You know, mine is just as important as yours, and that for real, Jesus took the dead Curtis and brought him to life, to real life. How many of you have ever resurrected somebody from the dead? So as the kids have encountered Jesus this week, I have one other encounter that has always been near and dear to my heart. It is the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. The story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Now, I know you think, well, this is just this fairy tale children's story, and it should be left in vacation Bible school, but I will tell you this. It is the encounter with Jesus that changes a man forever. And you and I, we, we should long to encounter Jesus. To know Him. And to see Him. And to experience Him. So we're going to read out of Luke chapter nine this, or 19 this morning. The first ten verses. You'll see them on the screen as well. It says, He, being Jesus, entered Jer- Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and he came down and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded any one of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Many of you can remember the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up into that sycamore tree to see what he could see. But the story is much more than just a kid's fairy tale. In the text, we find a man who is seeking the answers and is drawn to Jesus, and everything seems to prevent him from encountering Jesus. There's obstacles in his way, but he has the opportunity, and he takes it to see him. Jesus in Luke 18 tells a parable of the people who are bad. Among them was one of the worst tax collectors, possibly even referring to Zacchaeus because he was the chief of them. We know he was a fraudster, that he was a shyster. He was the one that you didn't want collecting your bills. He was not a good guy. He he took more than what was allotted for him. He had stolen from people, apparently. He had abused the system to make himself wealthy. 
Everyone knew who he was. Now you can all think of somebody in your life who you think, yeah, that's the one. That's the one that has no chance. That's what these people were thinking of Zacchaeus. By the way, who in here is not a sinner? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned, the Bible says, and fallen short of His glory, His standard. But even though that was the kind of a man Zacchaeus was, we also know that something was drawing him closer to Jesus. Maybe the stories that he had heard, maybe the large crowds that had followed him, possibly even conviction. But one thing was true, the Spirit seemingly was drawing him to Jesus. I mean, why else would you attempt to go every effort and every mile that you possibly can just so you can get a glimpse of this guy? I mean, there's popularity going on, but but he goes so far. So far as this little guy climbs in a tree. The crazy part though is when Jesus walks under the tree and calls out to old Zacchaeus by name and states that he's going to eat in his house that night. That's a big deal by the way. We see Jesus calling out to Zacchaeus and he responds back to him. It says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Just like Jesus calls out to all of us sinners, he calls for us to come to know him, that he might dwell with us and in us. Romans 8 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. The very indwelling of the Spirit of God signifies and fulfills the salvation of Jesus Christ to mankind. If you are not Spirit-full, you are Spirit-less. you know the cool thing is Jesus calls out to each and every one of us today just in the same way now it doesn't say that Zacchaeus never met Jesus or that he did meet Jesus before but Jesus seemingly knows him by name just like scripture tells us the Lord knows each and every one of us so much so that he he knows the number of hairs or the lack thereof on your head But he knew him personally. He knew what kind of person Zacchaeus was. And yet he was still willing to spend time with him. To call him. You see, we are called to answer his calling. For to deny it or not listen is to deny the very presence of the Spirit of God. And thus the salvation that he brings with him. And so Zacchaeus answers him. He says, So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. He quickly jumps out of the tree so that he can be in the presence of Jesus himself walking on the road. It was exactly what he wanted. But he thought he would never get the opportunity. One, because of his stature, but two, because also of who he was. You know, we've all seen people come to Christ, or at least they say they believed in Jesus. And not everyone has shown a repentant heart, though, do they? You see, it was no different then, these naysayers. One thing that I would like to point out is that it is difficult for an adult sometimes when they come to Christ. Simply because people knew what they were like back before that moment of conversion. You know, churches can be hard on people. Especially people who were once once lost. And in public sin. And then restored. One 
One thing that I would like to point out is that simple fact. Simply because people knew what they were like back then. Zacchaeus, they knew who he was. Many of them probably had been defrauded by him. Jesus himself said, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not deny, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. While a good rescue story is great and all, when it comes to changed lives, something it is just hard for people to take sometimes. That was the case with those who were watching this event unfold under the sycamore tree. He says, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. He stepped into his house. Now, hospitality was a big thing and still is in the Jewish tradition. But he steps into the house of this lost man. When I was up north, there was a gentleman when we were there and he, 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 in our church. And he came by to warn me that people drop beer cans alongside the road and and that I wasn't allowed to pick any of them up because someone might see them in my trash can. Interesting, huh? Didn't quite get the picture, did he? The people grumbled, and they were the complainers of the day, and you know the type, don't you? They knew who Zacchaeus was, and they thought there was no hope for a soul, and Something happens, though, while they are still standing there. The interesting part is they must not have been quiet about this because Zacchaeus hears what they have to say. Do you know it's not rare in the American church today either? Most grumblings, they take place in the hallways and in the back rooms, over the phone, just out of earshot. I can tell you this, each and every one of us we're equally wretched before Jesus. Zacchaeus isn't going to have any of that, though. He had experienced Jesus. He had seen him, talked to him, and now he had accepted him as the Son of God. He could not keep quiet what God was doing and the quietness within his soul. And this is his response. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it to them fourfold. He repays those whom he had stolen from over and above what was required. Dave Ramsey tells a story of whenever he had filed for bankruptcy and all of these people lost money because he didn't have enough in assets to pay for those, those bills that came due, so they just get closed off the way he filed bankruptcy. But when God began to bless him and began to use him in the ministry of finances within churches and other groups, and he began to make that money back, he, he decided, him and his wife, that he would repay those who he owed the bank money to. He repaid his bankruptcies, by the way, that he didn't have to repay. You see, that's what Zacchaeus is doing. He doesn't necessarily have to do this, but it's a show of his heart, isn't it? We see a man who's now been made new, something different. Before he was once only worried about himself and what could benefit him, but now it was about someone else. Jesus, just a few chapters before, had said to a crowd of people, so therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. There are many texts in Scripture that talk of dying to oneself and living in Christ. In Galatians, we see that it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then we see in Luke chapter 9, and it says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and to take up his cross daily and follow me. To die to oneself, it's no longer about you, but it is about him. And out of the love of God flows all good things. 
But Jesus responds to what Zacchaeus says. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You see, it's not because of what he does that Jesus replies those words. It was because he had shown a change of heart. He was a new creation. The entire demeanor of the man had changed. He had put his old self off and instead turned to see the truth of the Scriptures. His visible changes reflected his inward change. That is what Jesus calls us out of our sins for, to repent and to turn to Him, not only for Himself, but that others might see the change and long to see the same Jesus that you have. There are at least three things that we need to learn from the life of Zacchaeus, and it would serve us well to remember them today. The first one is we are all sinners, and we must recognize that fact. You know, for an addict, the first step they always say is admitting that they have a problem. The same happens for us in our addictions to sin. We must admit that there's a problem there. Zacchaeus, he was a public sinner. Everyone knew what his sins were. They knew he cheated them and he stole from them his very own people. And again, we read the words of Paul when he says, In Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, you and I, we are sinners. Just a fact, and we all know that deep down, but we just, we want to overlook it and cover it up. Measure it against how bad someone else is. You see, Zacchaeus had understood that he was wrong. Second, Jesus calls all sinners to repent of their sins. I found this amazing text and some words Jesus said to the religious elite of the day in Matthew 21. It says, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe in him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Now I want you to think for just a minute. John the Baptist comes in the way of righteousness to teach of the coming Messiah. And he says, you didn't believe in him. You didn't believe what John had to say. But guess who did believe in what John had to say? The tax collectors and the prostitutes. Now, I don't know any of you who enjoy paying your taxes, And we would all say that it's not an okay thing to be involved in prostitution. But they were the ones who believed what he had to say. And then he says, even when you saw it, even when you saw Jesus hanging on the cross, you didn't believe him. You didn't change your minds. And I find it very interesting because this is so much like our culture today. Is we can see a truth. And we can understand where we came about bringing it to truth. And we can see the evidence that is involved in that truth. But then we still don't believe the truth. I don't know, there's a lot of factors that go in that. Other people are saying, well, that's not the truth and, and those kinds of things. But, but it says you saw it happen and you still didn't believe it. The worst of the society in that time had believed and their hearts were changed, it says. Acts chapter 3 tells us, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. You know, we teach the kids in Bible school uh, that, that repentance is the turning away from, and it's not just that you turn away from a sin, but
but it's also that you run from it. There's, a, there's an action involved with it. It's hard for addicts to stay in the same place where the addiction occurs on a regular basis, isn't it? You and I, we are called to daily repentance. The denying of the flesh and sin and turning to the righteousness of Jesus. And thirdly, we see in Zacchaeus' life that Jesus is faithful to save. When you and I repent and we turn to the Lord, salvation is ours. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart one believes and is justified, and with a mouth one confesses and is saved. Kids have the opportunity of encountering Jesus in five places, and we see today this, oh, a sixth of many, countless times that people experience Jesus. And while we can look at the text and we begin to break it down, begin to try and understand it and reflect on it, the question that we must come back to at the end is simply, do I believe? Have I encountered Jesus? And if so, am I obeying and following His Word? Am I seeking Him in all things? You see, when you encounter Jesus, and when the kids encounter Jesus, and they saw in the text, in the Scriptures, that every time that they are encountering Jesus, each time the person was changed, the individuals had something different about them. And we come and we experience Jesus today, and that experience should change us. So my question to you is, have you encountered Jesus? Do you know Him? Do you love Him and do you serve Him? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank You for the opportunity again to come and worship You. And Father, we thank You for the truths of Your Word and Lord, how You speak to us through them. Father, we thank You for the opportunity that we get to see others encounter You. And Father, we ask that we would encounter You as well, that You would change our hearts and our lives. Father, help us to, to see You in all things, Lord God, to seek You out and to search You first in Your Word. Lord, I just pray that You would help us to repent and to turn away and to flee from sin. That you would help us to believe and to have faith in you. And God, that you would change our hearts and make us more like you. Father, we thank you and we praise you for loving us. We thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross that we might have eternal life with you. And God, we ask that you would be glorified. For it is in Christ's name, amen. God is speaking.